and we're not wizards. We are the best. And also, we're not wizards. Enjoy the show. Bye. <laughs> Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for February. Because it's first of February. It's uh, a wonderful, a wonderful time to be looking back on January and going, how did January go so quickly? Because January is supposedly the longest month, and it's only because people get paid usually before Christmas, which means that their their pound or dollar or yen or whatever has to stretch that a little bit further before they kind of head in it's almost like they need to make a keep a good eye on their kind of resources as they go through january and you know just like sometimes you have to dig beyond the back of the couch to find those hidden kind of notes and coins that have maybe dropped out your pocket sometimes you need to be going a little bit further sometimes you could potentially well if you're like our next guest they're taking it to the ocean to find the resources that are going to help themselves through January. Um, and not just the front of the shelf, they're going to the back of the shelf, they're dealing with their absolutely deep shelf. It's Richard Keane back with us. He's a repeat offender from Ninth Haven Games here to talk about his latest Kickstarter. How you doing, Mr Keane? Are you well? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm st- still the same. I've not changed. We'd been is that a good thing we... or a bad thing? I don't know. Are you, are you meant to change in these type of situations? I don't know. It's like I'm past, I'm kind of reaching that age. I'm at the age where I'm like kind of almost, I'm staring 50 down the barrel of a gun. And I think I can perfectly comfortably say I'm pretty comfortable with who I am. And I'm not for changing anymore. You get to that kind of curmudgeonly way where people say, well, they're they're that age now. They're never going to change their kind of their attitude. And I think I'm kind of approaching it. But um, still trying to just forge on ahead. But we're going, doing quite well. Um, last time we spoke, it was before, <laughs> before the plague, <laughs> before the skies turned black as sackcloth, before the plague. The plagues arrived and everything like that, you know, before the locusts and everything. Um, and Dinogenics had come along and you had controlled chaos and that went out to the kind of the, the backers and stuff like that. Um, so with the kind of the pandemic time, did you, because I know, I'm, 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 I'm right in saying that you kind of work kind of from home kind of anyway, so was there a huge that difference? Is correct. Was there a huge difference to kind of your lifestyle, or did, was it just a case of, oh, this is rubbish. I can't go to the shops anymore because everybody's working from home. So everybody's nipping round to the local store, and I'm not getting my usual kind of time to myself during the day. So the honest truth is, the first six months I barely noticed a difference, but yeah. <laughs> after six months, you know, the it got a bit old. I will put it that way. I think there's a difference between actually being working from home and having the choice to kind of be out and about and then being in the situation where you can't you can't kind of go anywhere. And I think it affected kind of different things in different way, uh, different people in different ways. Um, did it approach your kind of... Because talking way back, Dinogenics did very very well um and is still one of my favorite dinosaur themed worker placement games that's kind of out there um did that change your approach to kind of like the follow-up kind of like to to deep shelf with there being kind of opportunities and things like that changing with regards to play testing did that kind of change how you did went into the development with deep shelf Yes, actually, it made a, a pretty big uh, difference. So first of all, a lot of playtesting for 
controlled chaos and dinogenics was done digitally anyways so going forward i my initial thoughts were this isn't going to make that big of difference Mm -hmm. however at the time the pandemic hit we were starting to ship out physical prototype copies to people for Mm playtesting, and that took a big hit because um while you can do a lot of playtesting digitally, there comes a point where you do need to have feedback as far as the physicality of the game. Yeah. Because there there's a big difference between moving, you know, a meeple in person versus moving it in a digital environment. And with Deep Shelf especially, there is a large degree of physicality to the game. Yeah. There are quite a lot of components that can come out on the board, and manipulating the resources and moving them around the board is a big part of the game. So when we were moving from a purely digital environment for testing to a physical one, Uh, There were some startling revelations with how big things needed to be in real life versus what they could be uh, in, for example, Tabletop Simulator, which was our initial testing environment. Yeah, because I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at the the videos on Kickstarter and there's a lot of there's a lot of components kind of moving about the board but on top of that there's a lot of components you can move resources but you can put resources on some of the vehicles in order to move them around the board so did you find did that change kind of like oh we've got to change the size of this or we've got to change how this works because this is kind of like fiddly or this is easy or there's simply not enough space for everything to occupy the same kind of play area when we've actually got it in a physical version Yeah, so that was the main concern, Mm -hmm. uh, because when you're dealing with testing something digitally, size doesn't matter. Like, you can make the board, you know, 10 feet long if you wanted. That'd be a horrible idea, but you could do it. (laughs) Um, Twilight Twilight Imperium says hello. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, Whereas for this, like, I like to kind of base dimensions on you're realistically going to max out at about a a three by five foot space. Yeah. Um, That's about as large as you can go. And if you do take up a full three by five space, you're even at that size going to make some people a little uncomfortable because that is on the larger side of tables. Yeah. 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 So for this, we did have to scale back some things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Basically, every revision that we had made of the physical boards, it was like, how how many millimeters smaller can we make this component and still have it comfortable to fit? And how mm-hmm. much smaller can we make the uh, vertical dimensions of the, the main board and have it still work? So, that yes, that was a major concern. In terms of where were you in the development life cycle during the pandemic had is had uh, was deep shelf at an early prototype stage or was it something you you'd been running kind of alongside kind of controlled chaos because control can uh, control chaos is uh, there's a, a kind of a, a similarish kind of theme kind of ish as in what i mean by that is there's a lot of water kicking about the castle and i'm wondering there's part of me that thinks was when you were developing Controlled Chaos, did part of you then think, actually, this is another idea? I mean, where did you get the idea for Deep Shelf? Was it connected at all to Dynogenics in any way, or was it just another project you had kind of sitting at the side ready to develop? So the the idea for Deep Shelf was kicking around in my mind for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. But I would say heavy testing started... Uh, the 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 basically the the winter well fall before controlled chaos started shipping out to people Mm -hmm. yeah so we shipped in early 2020 we Mm -hmm. miraculously managed to ship right before the pandemic really started hitting people that yeah could have been disastrous if we didn't but thankfully ever uh the factory did shut down 
in early 2020, which did delay things a little bit, but yeah. then it reopened. We got everything on the boats and it made it out to people in early 2020, which was great. Wow. Because the second thing that obviously came about after that was the kind of the the shipping. <laughs> The second oh, yes. kind of flick that came about was, you know, folk were saying, yes, you get skies turning to sackcloth and the seas will turn red and uh, it's like shipping prices will go through the roof. And it's like, I don't remember that being one of the 10 plagues. It's like, well, you better believe it. But were you, from a practical point of view, when you were looking at, when you were kind of seeing the kind of the prices, and I mean, there's still companies out there looking to fulfill kickstarters just now who have just went guys we can't we can't do this we've had a really really successful kickstarter but we're about you know we're about six figures in the red here in terms of shipping prices and stuff like that did that give you pause on when you were going to kind of be launching the campaign did it make you actually kind of put it back to right right round about this time rather than kind of take the risk uh, absolutely. Uh, for about a year, I was following the the freight charts and just yeah. watching the number go higher and higher. And as soon as it would get to a point that just seemed utterly ridiculous, it went a little higher and then a little <laughs> higher after that. Yeah. And at this point, uh, it was honestly terrifying as yeah. a publisher because at those rates... There is no way to make a profit in the board game industry. The, the The margins on board game manufacturing are not that good to start with. And yeah. especially if you're a smaller publisher, uh, it just it wasn't attainable at that point. Was it kind of good because it, did it then give you a chance to kind of finesse the kind of the finer points of the game then? Because I still uh, see, I still see people rush out kind of games. I still, I still mm-hmm. kind of, you understand. I do get contacted by people saying, "Hey, look at my Kickstarter," and it's like, it's literally five blanks, blank bits of paper <laughs> and some dice <laughs> with some stickers on it. This isn't kind of like it's not ready to kind of be played. But did, did it give you a chance to kind of continue to finesse and get it to maybe a further stage than maybe where you would have been if you'd kind of put it on Kickstarter before that? I do ultimately think it's a better game now than it would have been if we launched during our original window. That's not to say that people wouldn't have enjoyed the game. Yeah. But when you're given another six to eight months to work on refinement, of course you're going to end up with a better product overall. Yeah. Yeah. What was, with you having the kind of the, the, the kind of the community because one of the things that I did notice was obviously with the success of like the original Dinogenics and you went from zero to, you know, a good steady kind of 68 miles an hour, which was pretty good. There would have been a community around it. Did you find it easier to get people involved in the kind of play testing? Was there a, a bigger resource there that wasn't there when you were kind of maybe play testing like the original kind of Dinogenics? Yes. So we roughly doubled to tripled our playtesting size between Controlled Chaos and Deep Shelf, which was great. Mm -hmm. Uh, Getting more diverse eyes on the project is always a good thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, when I was first getting started, Dinogenics was a very, very small operation. It was literally something that I was doing while working my regular day job. So, you know, very humble origins. Whereas <laughs> Deep Shelf, yeah. we're still not a big company, but I, you know, I'm able to get the game out to more people. I'm able to actually afford the higher artist when <laughs> yeah. um, new ideas arise. So that is a, a big difference between the two projects. Has it put you, are you, where are you in terms of kind of like job, job? Are then you, are you still kind of working pretty much a normal job, kind of like almost full time? Or is it kind of almost like a 50-50 gig 
where you're kind of so, spending a lot of the time on the gate on the the board game side of it, and the rest kind of making sure that you've got electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so at this point, um, Control Chaos was a good enough success that a, a large part of my time has shifted towards board game uh, creation. So that mm-hmm. is a, a big step there as well. Mm-hmm. So is it i t- i mean you're not i take it you're not going about going you know dollar dollar bill y'all <laughs> no no i <laughs> i still have to live quite humbly but yeah it was you know i was able to and this is a good thing during the pandemic where a lot of works uh shut down i was able to focus primarily on game design which was great from then from I mean, from in yourself, in kind of like a mental health point of view, with you devoting time on the board games and knowing that there's you can it's backing itself up in a financial way, did it have a positive effect on kind of like your mental space and your creativity? Knowing that it's like, oh no, I've got to go and spend four hours kind of like play testing this and designing this instead of I've got to get I've got to kind of go do eight hours working on this kind of IT system? Did it kind of change your kind of a little bit on kind of how you, how you kind of saw yourself from a mental health kind of point of view? So ironically, I would almost say it had the opposite effect because at this point, because I have made this my career at this point, it means that deep shelf, has to be a success which means <laughs> i yeah. have to put all the more effort and time into it because this has to be perfect it has to have customers the customers have to like it yeah and that is what it is okay so going forward i mean this is the this is kind of like the relaunch a deep shelf and we had some conversations in the background about this and this kind of resulted in you kind of coming back on was that when you when you really when you released kind of put deep shelf out there for the first time on kickstarter was there a lot of pressure then and how were you feeling when you had to kind of pull the plug on it kind of like the first time so that was an awakening. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I won't lie that there were a few sleepless nights around the first launch. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it's not the first time um, for any <laughs> yeah. any people that have followed Ninth Haven Games. They If they have been around long enough, they know that the very first launch of Dinogenics was also not a success. So yeah. I have been there. Uh, I knew what to expect. I knew yeah. what I was hopeful for, and it didn't quite cross that line. Yeah. But I also knew that because I had that experience with Dinogenics, I knew ways to improve things. Um, and basically, after pulling the plug, as you said, uh, just refocusing efforts to make sure the relaunch worked. And... So far, fingers crossed, it <laughs> continues to work. Did, did you, were you surprised that kind of like, because you, you would, I'm guessing you would have gone in with a certain strategy. And were you surprised that the kind of, the, the momentum from kind of dinogenics just didn't automatically kind of swirl into kind of deep shelf? So, yes, Uh, going from Control Chaos, which we had just short of 5,000 backers. Yeah. uh, There was, and this is, you know, my own failing for assuming that a lot of those would come over, Mm -hmm. uh, which I, I do think a lot of them were actually coming over, but they were backed at say the one dollar level or waiting to see what happened yeah uh so that i I should have actually anticipated that because deep shelf 
you know, it's a very different IP going from dinosaurs and a theme around a movie that will not be mentioned, but very <laughs> obviously uh, wears its theme on its sleeve yeah. to something that is completely new. Yeah, it's understandable that people were a little hesitant to jump into that. Yeah. Uh, I kind of, I know that from a personal point of view that my kind of me scouting about kind of Kickstarters kind of dropped a bit as well. And I think it was maybe because I wasn't sure. Well, okay, there was two things from my side of things. I think when you're looking at a Kickstarter campaign that you've got, you're getting sold what I call the sizzle as well as the sausage. So, and I think for a lot of games and Kickstarter, they rely on people sitting there and going, yeah, I'm going to play this. This is going to be brilliant because I can play this with like, Colin's going to love this and Leo's going to get this. And yeah, I can get Isaac around the table and he's really, really going to like this. He really kind of like this kind of worker placement game kind of thing. And I think one of the things with the pandemic, it kind of, again, it's like people were going, well, should I re... <sighs> I think it had people kind of assessing the kind of the games that they had and said, well, I'm not playing the games that I have, so is it worthwhile me kind of looking? I think people were kind of in a little bit of a limbo. They didn't know if they were actually getting outside to kind of get together with groups. And I think personally for me, it did put a little bit of a halt on me kind of actively. I didn't, there wasn't kind of like the, I guess, the desire there to have more stuff kind of coming in but that was only because I was still sitting there going it's it's really really difficult to kind of get more than two people together I mean I ended up playing a lot of the time a lot of the games I ended up playing was like me and my kids and you know that's what we did so I, I kind of kind of understand why people kind of took their time and I also think on the tail end of the shipping malarkey that that I think there was a couple of people that got backed and then we're getting these emails through saying, could you pledge us an extra $10 to make sure that you kind of got, got your game? So I think there's a little bit of, I think there was a little bit of um, kind of hesitation from, from kind of that side as, as well. Um, in terms of, <clears throat> now let's get down to the, the, the nitty gritty. In terms of Deep Shelf itself, what's the elevator pitch? What am I doing, Mr. Keen, in Deep Shelf? So this one, people seem to debate whether this qualifies as like a 4X game or if it shouldn't have that moniker. Oh. Um, I do tend to think of it kind of as a 3X game, you know, explore, exploit, mm -hmm. expand. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no exterminate in this game, obviously. We are nice, happy, peaceful <laughs> yeah. uh, base builders in the deep or... Well, at least two of those descriptions are accurate. But <laughs> uh, there, there is no combat. This is much more focused on uh, economic expansion. So I, I do kind of like to think of it as a 3X game with a focus on economy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I apologize if my cat is coming through. She wants in the room but she's also being noisy right now <laughs> that's fine i can't hear the cat but now okay. that you've mentioned the cat i'm going to make sure that when i edit <laughs> edit the show in the background i'm just going to say meow can i get in meow <laughs> okay i'll i'm gonna do that maybe i won't maybe i won't anyway um what was the what was the inspiration for it? What was the kind of the, the couple of games that you thought, yeah, I kind of like these kind of mechanics. If I'm going to do something else, this is what I'm going to kind of bring in. So the game that perhaps it shares the most similarities with is if you take the exploration and research elements of Eclipse, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that game. Yes. Uh, it's a, a big space empire building game if you were to take the exploration and science elements of that game but shift it down to where you are doing 
kind of the the economic manipulation of a game like maybe brass so those are two very different types of games but if you can vaguely imagine combining the two into uh, a game where you're you're all about the exploration and expansion and yeah. refining your resources and bringing them home that's kind of where the game sits it's not a perfect uh description of the game but it puts you in the the right ballpark where did the name come from because i la- when i saw the name i was laughed because i was like deep shelf i mean that could be you know that could be the man hunting for that last expansion that you know he bought kind of a year ago based <laughs> he can't find <laughs> but is this like a this is a not i know a shelf's like a not it's an a, it's an ocean flory type term isn't it really but what made you settle on deep shelf knowing that you were going to come on this show and there was a possibility i was going to take the mickey out of it <laughs> for you uh it, it just made sense uh the game was all about expanding on yeah. the ocean shelf and you're exploring down deep so the two seem to make sense so i just should, i should just be quiet and stop being silly is that is that kind of what you're saying absolutely pretty much is what yeah that's what i thought that's what i kind of thought that's what i kind of thought um when it came to the promotion side of things and i think we've had this conversation before that you're all up with the design and stuff like that, but the marketing side of things has always been something that you've never been 100% on. And I noticed you went out and there was a lot of kind of like preview videos and stuff like that, and there was a lot of kind of copies kind of out there. Um, Did you decide to take kind of like a different approach to kind of like the marketing on this side for Deep Shelf? So it's kind of funny you bring this up because once again this is something that is very much a struggle for a smaller publisher yeah uh and this is something that again i made assumptions that i shouldn't have made Mm -hmm. uh with controlled chaos obviously we were very well received we had lots of good positive reviews around the game yeah and lots of people to this day want to receive Uh, promo copies of the game so they can create their reviews of the game and they can't have them because we're sold out but that's something (laughs) different (laughs) but i made the assumption that because people were interested in reviewing dinogenics and covering it with various videos that these same people would be jumping at the opportunity to cover deep shelf that was not true (laughs) and in fact for uh months leading up to the launch of deep shelf on kickstarter um just like before with the launch of dinogenics it was a struggle to get companies that were interested in covering it many of these companies the large ones that obviously you want to see on a campaign they have some of them six months waiting list in order to cover your game yeah um the the thing you don't hear about because people obviously don't want to talk about it is a lot of companies also do paid previews and in general i try to avoid paid previews because while i know that they work they're also a little disingenuous you are you are basically paying for an advertisement at that point. And it's just, it's one of those things where you, you have to do it, but I I don't, I don't love that part of the industry, but yeah. So once again, just getting video coverage, it it's difficult if you are on the small side and you have one successful product. And aside from that, you know, you're you're not the the big guys that you know have ten or fifteen projects that they've launched already. Yeah, I know you can be damned at this as well. You're damned if you do and damned if you don't, because there are there are certain kind of guys out there that are known for doing kind of like their their paid previews, and it's kind of it's kind of like. 
They're known for doing their paid previews, but they get lots and lots of views and they've got lots and lots of subscribers. So you're essentially, you're, 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 you're not necessarily paying, paying for them to say, this is a good game and you should look at it. You're almost paying for the access to the 20,000 subscribers that they've got on YouTube and, you know, the several thousand views that you know that the video is going to get. So it's a kind of a weird thing. As a, the last person that I had, it was interesting, the last person that I had on the show was the editor of Tabletop Kind of Gaming magazine and him coming from the point of view that him saying his advertising revenue, the advertising team has nothing to do with kind of like the people who are actually, you know, reviewing or previewing kind of content, uh, games. Um, and he had some kind of choice choice phrases uh, to say about what he thought about kind of previous. But I, I can understand. It's like, as I, and I've beat this drum, it's got its own, I need to change the skin on it. But I, I just wish that they would say, um, I know they say this is paid content, but I wish some people would just say, look, we're a marketing company and we're damn good at it. And we'll guarantee you, thir- you know, we'll guarantee you, you know, 5,000 views on your project and, um, and we'll get you know because we've got you know fifty thousand subscribers kind of thing. Um, but I think I don't think we're kind of I don't think we're kind of there yet because we're still we're still kind of kind of very very small. Um, in terms then of the the previews, were you then caught in the situation where you had kind of copies, physical copies, kind of floating around out there? And you were actually needing to kind of chase people up and saying, guys, I know you said you would cover this, but have you got an actual time scale on kind of when this is going to happen? Did that kind of happen at all? So, yes. Uh, again, small company. We don't have many of the high production uh, quality preview yeah. copies. We have ones that are perfectly functional for playing the game, bouncing around, but... Yeah. You don't want to highlight those in a in a video because yeah. you know the the artwork is not final quality. You know you're using cubes instead of amazing looking uh, meeples and things like that. Um, so when it came to doing these videos, especially when it was getting close to the launch, because I had already set roughly when we were going to launch. Um, a lot of the the videos we did get in advance, they were all set to go. And I was just looking for a couple more people to do it. So it was like the month or two before and trying to get copies to these people like with enough um, advance notice. And it, it started to become a little bit of a nightmare because when shipping out these copies, the, the good copies, the ones you want to show in videos, you mm-hmm. have to take in consideration at least a week for transit times. Yeah. And then you have to give the people long enough to actually play the game a couple times. Yeah. So you're probably looking at at least a week, probably two weeks. So that means that everything needs to be done at least a month in advance. Yeah. And so some of the videos that we had intended to launch with just didn't happen during the first Kickstarter because it was impossible to get those copies to them with enough lead up room. Um, one of them, it was literally the day, uh, the, the weekend before the launch. And I was looking at the tracking information and I had to contact them and be like, uh, I, I'm, sorry this is not going to arrive in time (laughs) and that is a very awkward conversation to have (laughs) to put it lightly yeah yeah because i guess if you've got a pile to work through then you'll timetable them but if you're depending on when kind of things kind of things kind of arriving i mean i know i kind of get it's like strange because i'm on the other I, i get that i get like sometimes like well I get review copies sent to me. Now, depending where they're coming from, you know, if I get, it's interesting, if I get something sent from Europe, it'll take like maybe a week, week and a half. But if I've I've had stuff sent from the States over to me and that's been like four four or five weeks, it's just like, 
you know and it's like oh has it been sent it's like yeah it's been sent it's just that it's been held up at you know various ports or it's been held up through customs and stuff like that as well so i kind of totally i kind of totally understand where that where that kind of coming from um at the same time um did you do you have the conversation with like the ones that are saying oh i don't suppose i could kind of keep this <laughs> after i've done my piece on that or were people uh, so quite that's good in- actually that's less common at least with the the copies we have they're they're more interested in hey can we get a you know full production copy for final review when that eventually ships which i think is reasonable um whereas the 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 initial prototype copy you know there there are still pieces in that even the the higher production quality that are not quite um final production well i'm saying production quality a lot but they're not quite final production yeah quality. yeah no i get it and yeah, the reason yeah. for that is all of the miniatures in our game have been 3d printed for all of the uh pre-release copies we do not have the full injection mold copies because those are you know every every mold every model that's <laughs> roughly uh a five to ten thousand dollar investment right there so we don't have those we do have yeah. very nice 3d printed components <laughs> yeah 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 which yeah and i can imagine it's like well i'd like to give you the i'd like to give you the nice stuff in the preview copy but um you'd need to give me, you need to give me 10 grand to get you the nice <laughs> in yes, fact you might exactly. as well just pay for the kind of the the kind of the kickstarter was there right was what was it like then did you get did you get people doing kind of previews but they were using kind of tabletop simulator then i mean was there a lot did you get any of those or were most of the videos based around the kind of like the actual physical copies so you anybody can scroll through our videos and to be clear we do have previews and reviews so there there are both here yeah uh and some of them received physical copies some of them did do it from digital Mm -hmm. uh it's generally as far as like demonstrating the game for other people and making sure that they know the rules i did a lot of initial teaches with the people that did the the videos uh, on tabletop simulator just to give them a general rundown of how the game plays make sure that when they are playing and reviewing that you know they got the rules right Mm -hmm. um and a a lot of them did it both ways so i would do an initial teach and then they would have the physical copy and i think that just makes sense for a lot of people because a lot of the bigger channels they also they're receiving a lot of prototype games and to learn a new game every day that's a lot it's a lot easier if you have you know the designer on a conference call to go through things with you i think just to get the grasp as well because as knowing as someone who has played preview copies of games and also review copies of games i am very aware that I have gone back to a game three or three or four months down the line and kind of played it with friends again, you know, um, and went, oh, <laughs> this rule's slightly wrong. <laughs> you know, my most fa- I think my most famous one was Viticulture, but I never kind of did a, any kind of review content of it, Viticulture or anything like that. I just kind of like, I spoke about it, but I kind of, it was one of these things I realised at the time that kind of like the vines stayed in the farm and didn't kind of disappear when you made the grapes. And it was like, it made such a huge, it made made such a huge um, kind of difference to how the kind of the game was played. Um, it kind of like, yeah, okay. But at the same time, I have done kind of like tabletop simulator kind of run throughs with kind of develop with the developer and designers. And it's amazing how like a half hour session can change like a a kind of a 20, a 20 page rule book down to something that kind of like is really kind of fully understandable. And I think it's like a hybrid between the two. Um, if you get good scripting on like a tabletop game where people can't kind of break how things work, 
then I think it can really help to to kind of play it. I had an experience with um I don't know if you heard of mind management, Richard, the kind of hidden movement game. Uh, I'm familiar with it. I've never yeah. played it. It's like they've got like um it's kinda of like I wasn't a big fan of the rule book. Um, and I said so in my review, it was kind of like, it could have done with kind of like an entry level, kind of smaller rule book. But one of the things that really, really helped in it was that um, that they had like a, an app and the app literally taught you how to kind of play and it taught you how to kind of, um, how kind of, kind of like to, to work through it and stuff like that. So that kind of, that kind of, kind of, kind of really helped. Um, so that was kind of, that was kind of cool. One of the questions I've got, right, because you've ran kind of successful kind of Kickstarters, do you then feel obliged? Is there any kind of, is there a kind of a conversation with some of the people that you work with that say, we kind of expect a kind of a final version copy to kind of be sent to us if you kind of successfully fund? Like after the or? after the event, yeah, it'd be like you know me saying you know um you know once once the game is in production, once it's finished, and once it's getting shipped out, do you do you then feel there's kind of like a, a kind of a a quiet agreement to make sure that the people that have kind of helped spread the noise, you know, that have helped kind of promote you, that you send them kind of like a final kind of production game, or is that just something that is like up entirely up to yourself? I think that it's generally a good policy to mm. like, I, I don't think there is like a requirement, but no. it, it's one of those things where it, it, like the dice tower, for example, are going to get a copy no matter what, because yeah. they're a reviewer. That's one of the biggest YouTube channels. Of course, they're going to receive a copy. Um, and then you have like people that did do videos for you and things like that. Well, yeah. they received a pre-production copy. Yeah. Uh, but if you send them a full copy, they might do a review for you. So it just kind of goes hand in hand. And yeah, um, the same yeah. thing with like play testers, uh, play testers that have been with us for a long time, they're going to get a free copy. No, no questions there. So yeah, I don't know how much in depth you wanted to go there. No, but I think... no, it's just it's just interesting because I I see I do see people that kind of put it under their kind of re, their kind of review policy to say that you know if they do a preview on their game they kind of expect to have a copy. I've seen other people that are kind of like, well, I'm not fussed. I mean, personally, on our on our uh, review policy that we have, we actually say, well, if we do kind of like any kind of coverage for you, we don't we're not we don't expect you. To kind of send us out a final, a kind of, a kind of a final version of the game. Um, um, I think it's kind of each. I think it's kind of each to their own. I, I think that some people, if they get a real kick out of the game, I think they'd also be like, "Yeah, I really, really liked your game," and it's like, "Oh, but you didn't send me a final copy. That's a shame." And I think there's some there's some games that you play in preview that you're just like, "These are absolutely wonderful," and I'm just going to go ahead and kind of pick up my own copy. And so it's really funny because I know of some people who have played preview games, really, really liked them, but then they couldn't back the Kickstarter at the time. But then when it came to actually getting hold of a copy of the game afterwards, they couldn't get a copy of the game afterwards because it was like gold dust. You know, it'd be like trying to get Control Chaos. It's like sold out. You can't get another copy. Like sitting there going, me sad. <laughs> I can't, play, I can't, I can't, I can't play the game that I kind of really, really, I kind of really, really, really liked, you know. Um, where are you next in your kind of your designer development, you know, um, kind of journey? I mean, are are we are we gonna get the kind of the are we gonna get the kind of the 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 spicy food, keen as mustard, kind of party game? coming out in ninth haven are you, are you quite have you have you already kind of got like the next kind of two or three games kind of planned out in your head and is this the kind of the direction that you're thinking of going so probably not a party game uh, i'm <laughs> keen as not... mustard's a good name though richard i mean you've 
<laughs> I'm I'm not much of a, a party game player. Uh, <laughs> but... unless, unless it's hilarious adult party game, which I must I, I mean I've I've not had my my email for this week from a Kickstarter campaign that's saying here's our hilarious adult offensive party game. Maybe it's gonna be coming from you. But no, sorry. So I will say say that I might be smarter if I were to develop a few of those because they seem to do very well on Kickstarter and I can't imagine the costs are very high for making them. (laughs) It's like printing out a deck of... I mean, it's like literally it's playing card cost, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, But I mean, uh, in all seriousness, I kind of get... I must kind of get about two or three emails a month from somebody who's about to do their hilarious kind of adult party game and i'm just like but cards cards against humanity exists and you can literally pick it up at like you can literally pick it up at the local news agents you know you can walk into a kid's soft play area and they've got (laughs) they've got cards against humanity kind of stall there you can pick it up kind of left right and center so i don't understand are you going to be more offensive you know i I think um, that's the goal Always be more offensive. Be more <laughs> offensive. I did have somebody that did that did kind of contact me, and I said, you know, they were talking about kind of like different things. It was a combination of of stuff, um, and they're basically saying if you could have any superpower, and it was kind of like be as disgusting as possible. It's like, do you know that it'd be really fun if this was just like a kids' game, and it could be like you know you had cheese for boogers and. You know, or you could, you know, you could run really, really fast, but uh, you left uh, like a trail of slime behind you and stuff like that, instead of like obviously, um, just kind of like the adult version. But I, I don't know what happened to that game. We'll, we'll never ever kind of find out. But no, but do you have, you know, you've done the dinosaurs, you've done deep under sea. I mean, is there? Are we looking at the trip to the zoo, or are we looking at the space game, or are you doing something to do in construction, Mister Keen? Inquiring minds, inquiring minds need to know. So the next project, and this was already previewed uh, about a month ago now, is we are returning to Dinogenics for Yay! a third printing. Yes. Uh, it is going to include a mini expansion, so it's not going to be as big as Controlled Chaos was, but it will be including some new dinosaurs, it'll have some new breaking news events, some new uh, tile, well, uh, facilities, but that is what it is. It will also include a... uh, bigger box Uh, i'm not going to say big box because it's not that much bigger than the core game but it is designed to hold controlled chaos and the new mini expansion all in a single box because that was one of the most requested features and you'll be able to pick that up with the mini expansion if you're a returning backer or if you're a new backer you'll be able to buy the all-in so that is the next thing on the agenda, and with any luck, that should be happening later this year. We'll uh, see how it goes, um, but that's the that's the plan. I really like Dinogenics. Um, I, I just I, I've it's kind of like I I kind of I, I have always liked it, and it's it's like it has stayed in my collection, unlike other dinosaur kind of based games. Um, pretty much uh but that's you know um yeah because of um it kind of it kind of fitted really really well and it flowed really really well together and everything kind of made a logical sense whereas i felt that um and i'll be straight i felt dinosaur island was a bit bitty it was like kind of like playing seven seven or seven or eight different multi uh, little smaller kind of games but then had a kind of an overall thing and i'm not obviously trying to draw you into making any comparisons but it's still there i've still got control chaos um it's a game that i will i'll definitely be keeping an eye on and i'll definitely be keeping an eye on the on the expansion when it comes out later on this year um if people also want to keep an eye on what's happening 
at Ninth Haven Games. Where can they find you on the internet webs, Mr. Keen? Oh, you expect me to know my own social media accounts. I expect <sighs> you to know it. I expect you to know it by now. Seeing it, so it's like it's been years since, like obviously, you know, we start. Do you know? Do you know what I could do? I'll tell you what. Let's make it. E- <laughs> let's make it easier, right? I'm just gonna. We're gonna do this live because it's fun and exciting, right? Okay. Let's go to the last time you were on the show, <laughs> right? Which, as we said, was like what well, twenty twenty nineteen. I'm just going to type. This is live, folks. You don't get any much more live. than Well, it's not live because this is now recorded and edited. So you'd be like that. Why doesn't he just edit this out? What is he, some kind of idiot? Um, so I'm going to read it instead. So you can go to, you can follow um, Richard on Twitter at Ninth Haven Games. Um, or you can go to ninthhaven.com. Or there's also the Facebook uh, page which is uh, facebook.com forward slash dinogenics. You can go there as well. We are going to make sure that we put the links to the current Kickstarter campaign for Deep Shelf in the show notes so that we have got notes to show. Um, that's about right, isn't it, Richard? There is one more. Oh, one okay. One more. Um, okay. We, uh, we now have a Facebook page for Ninth Haven Games, mm-hmm. which is literally just facebook.com slash ninth haven games there you go that's breaking news that you're hearing that just now that's exciting and new and we shall also make sure that we put that in the show notes so that everybody's aware of it um and if you want to keep an eye on what we are up to just go to the uh just go to the internet webs and search for we are not wizards you shall find us in all the places uh, where the wild things are basically um and the non-wild thing, the calm things, but also the wild things. And we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter and we're on Instagram. And you can, if you want to read our reviews, you can read them on we'renotwizards.co.uk. If you want to keep an eye on the podcast, you can go to we'renotwizards.com. If you want to keep an eye on all, all of our other links, you can go to linktr.ee forward slash we'renotwizards. That's our link tree and you'll find all of our links there. If you like what you've listened to tonight, consider leaving us a rating or a review on the Apple Podcasts. And if you are going to be live giving, giving us a rating or a review, um, don't give us 10 stars, because it maketh us biggeth headed. Um, but don't give us zero stars, because it makes us cry. Um, give us um, give us five, because it's in the middle. It's a bit average. We are just that little bit average. And we're almost seven years old now, and that's just strange. But the person who's not been average is the rather wonderful, rather fantastic Mr. Richard Keane. Thank you for being on again. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, as always. There's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember there were many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizard, Richard? You might be a wizard. I'm not a wizard. (laughs) I'm thinking about it. I've been toying around with hats and stuff. That's all I'll say. Um, and the second thing... They're very fashionable. They're, they, do you know what? Seeing this cold weather, if you want to keep something off your, you know, the wind off your hair, and if it's a cone shape and a wide brim, you do quite well at keeping the head, the hat on your head, and also keeping the rain off you. So that, you know, wizard hats, they're not entirely bad. Um, and the other thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from the rather wonderful, rather fantastic Mr. Richard Keane. Say goodbye, Richard. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye for me. Remember, stay safe, roll sixes, make something awful. And um, get your wellies on, get your raincoat on, take a dive, a deep dive into the deep shelf. And until the next time, goodbye. A wizard is never late.
is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to. 